Alright class, we're going to begin discussing population genetics. Alright, so um, we'll discuss the differences between micro and macro evolution. Alright, we'll focus our attention on micro evolution, the major driving forces of micro evolution, and tie in some of the, the concepts from Mendelian genetics and non-Mendelian genetics chapters into population genetics. All right, so here kind of clear up any uh, misconceptions you have about evolution. Here's a, a brief clip on, on evolution. Myths and misconceptions about evolution. Let's talk about evolution. You've probably heard that some people consider it controversial, even though most scientists don't. But even if you aren't one of those people, and you think you have a pretty good understanding of evolution, chances are you still believe some things about it that aren't entirely right. Things like, evolution is organisms adapting to their environment. This was an earlier, now discredited theory of evolution. Almost 60 years before Darwin published his book, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposed that creatures evolve by developing certain traits over their lifetimes, and then passing those on to their offspring. For example, he thought that because giraffes spent their lives stretching to reach leaves on higher branches, their children would be born with longer necks. But we know now that's not how genetic inheritance works. In fact, individual organisms don't evolve at all. Instead, random genetic mutations cause some giraffes to be born with longer necks, and that gives them a better chance to survive than the ones who weren't so lucky. Which brings us to survival of the fittest. This makes it sound like evolution always favors the biggest, strongest, or fastest creatures, which is not really the case. For one thing, Evolutionary fitness is just a matter of how well suited they are to their current environment. If all the tall trees suddenly died out and only short grass was left, all those long-necked giraffes would be at a disadvantage. Secondly, survival is not how evolution occurs. Reproduction is. And the world is full of creatures like the male anglerfish, which is so small and ill-suited for survival at birth that it has to quickly find a mate before it dies. But at least we can say that if an organism dies without reproducing, it's evolutionarily useless, right? Wrong. Remember, natural selection happens not at the organism level, but at the genetic level. And the same gene that exists in one organism will also exist in its relatives. So a gene that makes an animal altruistically sacrifice itself to help the survival and future reproduction of its siblings or cousins can become more widespread than one that is solely concerned with self-preservation. Anything that lets more copies of the gene pass on to the next generation will serve its purpose. Except... Evolutionary purpose. One of the most difficult things to keep in mind about evolution is that when we say things like genes want to make more copies of themselves, or even natural selection, we're actually using metaphors. A gene doesn't want anything and there's no outside mechanism that selects which genes are best to preserve. All that happens is that random genetic mutations cause the organisms carrying them to behave or develop in different ways. Some of those ways result in more copies of the mutated gene being passed on, and so forth. Nor is there any predetermined plan progressing towards an ideal form. It's not ideal for the human eye to have a blind spot where the optic nerve exits the retina, but that's how it developed, starting from a simple, photoreceptor cell. In retrospect, it would have been much more advantageous for humans to crave nutrients and vitamins rather than just calories, but over the millennia during which our ancestors evolved, calories were scarce, 
and there was nothing to anticipate that this would later change so quickly. So, evolution proceeds blindly, step by step by step, creating all of the diversity we see in the natural world. Alright, so... <clears throat> here, all right, as you just saw in that video, all right, it's, it's pretty clear that individuals do not evolve. All right, popula populations evolve. Populations change over time. All right, evolution occurs at the population level. Here, for example, natural selection, one of the <coughs> One of the many driving forces of evolution occurs on individuals within a population. Okay. And over time, those populations will change. Now more specifically, you'll see a change in the, the phenotypes of the individuals, which is ultimately reflected in the alleles that the individuals carry. Right, that's what's going to give rise to these changes over time, macro microevolution. All right, is the changes in allele frequency over time. All right, so <clears throat> for example, all right, looking at how quickly evolution can take place, all right? Looking at how quickly populations can change from one point in time to another, all right? So here, you have a, a population of medium ground finches, all right? The average beak depth is just shy of nine millimeters. But here, 1978, right, after a drought, right, the average beak depth is now closer to around nine and a half mil years. So here, during this drought period, we had larger beaked birds that were more capable of breaking apart the larger seeds. All right, so you see a shift in the structure of the population because those individuals were then able to mate, they're able to reproduce, produce offspring, which their offspring would have more, would have a larger beak size, all right, if this is a heritable trait. All right, that's another key, key distinction here. All right, these processes that drive evolution, all right, they can only act on traits that have a genetic component. All right, so here there has to be a genetic component to the the beak size in the birds as a heritable trait. So here the beaks, the birds with the larger beaks were favored, they reproduce, have more offspring, more of those offspring have larger beaks, and again they reproduce, and you see the population level change to where a, more, a larger proportion of the population has a larger peak, peak size. Now, this can change over time. All right, there may come an instance where the birds of the same species with smaller beaks that's more advantageous at that point in time. So it makes sense that, okay, they are able to obtain, obtain more nutrients, more of them survive, more of them mate, more of them reproduce, and the population levels could change to where that becomes more predominant, the population. Okay, so microevolution. All right, you're talking about changes in the allele frequency at loci in the genome over time. Okay. Macroevolution. You're basically looking at this process of microevolution, but on a much larger scale 
where it gives rise to uh, speciation, it gives rise to new species. All right, so some of the major driving forces of, of what we're going to call evolution from here on out. All right, so we're going to use the word <coughs> evolution in place of, of microevolution. All right, so from here on out, all right, it's going to be understood that the word evolution and microevolution mean the same thing, even though they don't necessarily do. All right, for this this topic, this discussion, evolution or evolving, we're referring to microevolution. We're referring to the changes in the allele frequencies within a population over time. Okay, so the mechanisms that give rise to changes in allele frequencies. One, all right, one of the major players is natural selection. All right, so natural selection acts against those particular traits or alleles that are not well suited for a particular environment. All right, so you see alleles within a population increase in frequency that increase the reproductive success of an individual. All right, natural selection acts on the phenotypes of individuals within a population. All right, and as a result, by acting on those phenotypes, you're indirectly acting on the genotypes and thus the alleles. Genetic drift. All right, genetic drift is the chance occurrences that occur within a population. These chance events, um, drastic population size reduction, like, for example, maybe a flood, maybe um, some type of predator right, wipes out a huge proportion of the population. Some type of disease wipes out a huge proportion of the population. It's random. All right. Genetic drift is a random process, but it changes the allele frequencies. All right, there are these random chance events. Gene flow. All right, gene flow has to do with individuals entering a population and leaving a population. All right, so as individuals enter and leave a population, they're bringing in new alleles and they are removing alleles from a population. And then lastly, mutations. Now, mutations. Mutations and evolving changes in allele frequencies. Again, mutations have to be have to be heritable. All right. So these are, are mutations that are occurring within the the gametic cells, your sperm and egg cells. Okay. All right, so one of the prerequisites for evolution is that you have to have variation within a population. All right, so for a population to change over time, for the allele frequencies to change over time, all right, you have to have variation. If there's no variation, the population isn't gonna change because there's nothing for it to change to. So you're familiar with this whole idea of, of genes being responsible for traits, right? phenotypes, when you physically see an individual. Or a phenotype can be a biological molecule that's involved in a biochemical process. All right? You'll, 
you'll read about, you should read about, should have read about uh, sickle cell anemia. All right, this pops up again in this chapter. All right, you see it in um, the genetics chapters. All right, you'll see it again here. Now, when you're talking about a phenotype, the genetics are one component of that. You have to take into account the environment. The genetics basically create the, the boundaries of expression for a particular phenotype. You have to take into account the environmental factors. All right? It could be temperature. It could be uh, nutrition. It can be the um, health care an individual receives. If we're talking about uh, phenotypic characteristics regarding um, regarding health, regarding uh, human height, for instance, growth and development. All right, your genetics basically create the lower and upper boundaries of how tall you're going to be, for example. But the environment plays a role. All right. Do you get the adequate nutrition? Do you get the adequate exercise? Do you get the adequate um, sunlight you need for absorption of vitamin, vitamin D? It's involved in growth, expansion of bones. All right, so thinking back to how genetic variation occurs. All right, recall how you can gen generate genetic variation from meiosis. In sexually reproducing organisms, three processes lead to most genetic variation. Independent orientation of chromosomes in meiosis, crossing over of chromosomes in meiosis, and random fertilization. Each pair of homologous chromosomes consists of one chromosome inherited from the father and one from the mother. Here we have color-coded them blue and red. Each pair of chromosomes lines up independently of the other pairs in metaphase one of meiosis. Here you see one of the possible arrangements and outcomes. There are two different ways that each chromosome pair can line up. That means that in the organism shown here, with the diploid number of four, independent orientation of chromosomes at metaphase one can produce gametes with four different combinations of maternal and paternal chromosomes. In a human being, with 46 chromosomes, more than 8 million combinations are possible. Now let's look at how crossing over creates even more genetic variability. During prophase 1 of meiosis, homologous chromosomes pair up very closely, and corresponding parts of two non-sister chromatids may trade places. This process of crossing over creates variation by producing chromosomes that combine the genes inherited from two parents. Here the process produced a total of four genetically different gametes. There are many ways crossing over can occur. In humans, crossover events happen an average of two or three times per chromosome pair, greatly increasing the variation among eggs and sperm. Note that crossing over produces some parental gametes with chromosomes like those of the parents, and some recombinant gametes with a mixture of genes from both sets of chromosomes. Independent orientation and crossing over occur simultaneously during meiosis, multiplying the number of genetic variations among gametes. Because each pair of chromosomes lines up independently, and crossovers can occur almost anywhere along each pair of chromosomes, it is possible for a human being to produce an almost infinite variety of gametes. A sperm fertilizes an egg, producing a zygote. The random nature of fertilization adds to the variation arising from meiosis. Each parent is capable of producing a huge variety of genetically different gametes. The number of possible combinations among their offspring is staggering. Theoretically, one human couple is capable of conceiving a number of genetically different offspring that is far greater than the number of humans who have ever lived. All right, so <clears throat> looking at variation within a population, 
right? So recall what a population is. We have individuals belonging to the same species living within the same area. All right, so here you have discrete, discrete characters or, or traits, all right, that you classify on an either or basis. All right, so for example, all right, discrete characters. All right, you have individuals that are homozygous dominant. You have individuals that are heterozygous, and you have individuals that are homozygous recessive. All right, individuals with at least one copy of a dominant allele, for example, express the dominant phenotype. Individuals with two copies of the recessive allele express the recessive phenotype. Now, quantitative characters are going to vary along a continuum within a population. All right, so hopefully, hopefully you'll recall from the genetics chapter that there are some traits that are, for instance, we call polygenic traits or due to polygenic inheritance. All right, one example of polygenic inheritance, all right, is gonna be skin color. Or, for instance, human height. All right, there are many genes that play a role in determining skin color and human heights so within a population you see variation on continuum from really light to really dark, really short to really tall. All right, a lot of times this particular type of uh, characteristic follows a nice belt shape curve. All right, you have your individuals here and here, all right, that are what we consider the extre extremes all right, so really light skin tone, really dark skin tone, really short, really tall. All right, and then you have a majority of the population that falls here on average. Now, each population of individuals, this can vary. All right, but within a population, you end up with this continuum. All right, so you can measure the the genetic variation of each individual of the population, and you can get an, an estimate or an idea of the amount of variation within that population. All right, and the amount of variation is tied in with the overall predictability of how well that population could survive. All right, we'll talk about why that is a little bit later. All right, but here, one way they go about doing that is measuring the average heterozygosity, which is nothing more than the amount, percentage, average of individuals within that population that are heterozygous for a particular gene. In this case, you're looking at more likely many genes, and you're looking at whether or not for each gene individuals are homozygous dominant, whether they're heterozygous or whether they're homozygous recessive. All right. Ultimately, we're looking at the amount of heterozygosity, number of individuals that are heterozygous. Because recall, individuals that are heterozygous, all right, for instance, here, all right, you have a copy of the dominant allele and a copy of the recessive allele. All right, so, this in and of itself leads to genetic variation because this individual can produce two types of gametes. All right, they can produce a, a big A and a little a allele. While on the other hand, individuals that are homozygous dominant can only produce one type. Individuals that are homozygous recessive, recall, they can only produce one type. All right, so the health, genetic health of a population, all right, you measure using average heterozygosity.
you can take it a little bit further and you can look at the the actual base pairs that make up the DNA all right for a particular a particular gene and you can look at the amount of genetic variation at the DNA level And you can see where you have, for instance, alterations or mutations in the genetic code, all right, for a gene, all right? Now, <clears throat> in, in further chapters that we'll cover, all right, you'll read about uh, exons and trons, all right? <clears throat> kind of give you a little heads up. Exons are what we call coding coding regions of the DNA. Introns are what we call non-coding regions. Um, a lot of times introns are what they call um, junk DNA. All right, That's actually no, no longer the case. We'll talk about why it is later. All right. right now, what you're looking at is for a stretch of, of DNA, all right, for a gene, all right. So this gene, you're going from uh, the beginning of the gene, base, you know, base one, all right, to the very end, base 2500, all right. And so you have mutations, you have insertions, you have base substitutions, all right. You can have deletions, you can have additions, all right. Additions are also referred to as as insertions, all right. So here you can have alterations to the genetic code, which is ultimately going to result in, and for instance, um, you can end up with, let's say you have allele A. Well, allele A, you have these alterations, right? You can now have variants, right? You can have allele A1, allele A2, allele A3. All right, you can end up with variation due to all these alterations, all these mutations. So individuals within the population can produce variations, small variations, that alter ultimately the structure going from a gene to a protein, they alter the st structure, the function of that protein very slightly. Maybe this is advantageous, maybe this is disadvantageous, all right? but you also generate variation at the DNA level. Now, not all variation is heritable. <clears throat> all right, so these are two individuals that belong to the same species of caterpillar. All right, Nemoria, Arizona area. All right, so these are belong to the same species. All right, they're identical. Now, the question is why they look different. And your, your first guess would be, well, it has to do with the, the DNA, it has to do with the genes that are being expressed. Well, yes, all right, but it doesn't have anything to do with what they've inherited. All right, it has everything to do with, for instance, their diet. All right, so so here 